So thank you so much, uh, Pablo and, and uh, Spike, for having me. Um, I really, uh, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, so today, uh, I'm going to talk to you about some of the work that I'm doing uh, in my research lab at the MIT Media Lab. Um, so as Pablo mentioned, I run a group there called High Low Tech. And more specifically, today I'm going to talk to you about expressive electronics. Um, and I'll explain what that means in a second. Um, before I get started, I wanted to mention that the work that I'm going to show you today and talk about um, is work that I've done in collaboration with uh, a wonderful, wonderful team of graduate students. Um, in particular, uh, Jennifer Jacobs, Sam Jacoby, Emily Lovell, uh, David Mellis, Ji Chi, and Candy McHugh. So the primary aim of my research and the work that we do kind of in my group is to help people build stuff, to help people make things. And more specifically, we are interested in helping people build technology, or kind of what is loosely today we think of as technology, that is electronic and computational systems. Um, but when we look uh, at this space and what it means to help people build things, um, we notice that different kinds of people approach construction approach creation in really different ways. Um, so lots of people um, think and work abstractly. That is, they like to create and manipulate symbols. Um, and this is a, a style of building and construction that's maybe especially prevalent in technology spheres, right? This is kind of the foundational way that you approach building computational systems as you work with abstraction. Um, but that's one way of building stuff. Kind of a different kind of person, a kind of different group of people really likes to work concretely. So they're really driven by the kind of sensual engagement with concrete physical materials, inspired by kind of the feel of mud, maybe, or the color of a piece of fabric. So this is a really different approach to building and making. Um, likewise, some people are planners. So, so some people uh, approach the making task by kind of figuring out in advance exactly what they need to do to accomplish a specific goal. But on the other hand, uh, people are also uh, very improvisational. So a different approach to making is to kind of start building something with maybe even no particular goal in mind and just to see what happens in the moment. So to just let events maybe somewhat unexpectedly unfold and lead you to new places. Um, a, a final uh, axis that I think is interesting to think about is that some people's making is really driven by functionality. So some people like to build stuff uh, to make our lives more efficient, uh, more productive, uh, more comfortable. And they feel that the most important, or one of the, you know, their driving motivation to construct stuff is to make something useful, useful to society. Um, conversely, a really different kind of culture of making focuses more on expression. So focuses on trying to communicate something important or compelling or meaningful about the human experience to others. Um, so these uh, are uh, some core axes to construction and creation that have come up in the work that we do and also come up in our conversations with other people about what it means to make and build stuff. Um, in our work, and also kind of in the educational settings that we're part of, we've found that kind of traditional technology and traditional technology education certainly tends to kind of live in this space. So um, technology construction and design generally and loosely tends to focus on abstraction, tends to focus on really planned out kind of systematically structured activities. <laughs> And it tends to focus on functionality, utility. Um, so we're really interested in 
trying to very explicitly bring different kinds of experiences to the table when people work with technology. So we're interested in adding, kind of keeping those core uh, values and styles, but adding uh, uh, a style of working and an approach that incorporates concreteness, physicality, sensuality, improvisation, um, and expression. So, um, here's kind of the statement that I started with that expresses the goal and the kind of uh, purpose of the work that I do, but a more accurate, if somewhat less uh, concise and articulate uh, expression maybe looks something like this. So what we're really interested in doing is helping lots of different kinds of people create lots of different kinds of technology, ideally maybe different, so different that we haven't really seen anything like it before, um, using really different kinds of materials and utilizing really different kinds of processes, both kind of physical and intellectual processes. Okay, so that was a, a big preamble. What does this actually mean? What does this actually look like in practice? Um, so let's kind of start to check that out. Um, so today I wanted to focus on a couple of different media that we're using to explore these axes. Um, and the first one that I wanted to talk about is sketching. So I'm gonna share with you a few different techniques and tools that we've developed that let us combine paper and electronics and computation. And now I'm actually gonna stop talking for a bit and just show you a couple of videos that illustrate kind of how this is possible. How do you sketch with electronics and computation? one example of how you can sketch out uh, electronics. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't think I'm going to say too much about that. I'm just going to roll on to uh, another example of some of the work that we've been doing in, in essentially sketching uh, paper-based electronics. Um, the second example works with um, a slightly more accessible and readily available uh, set of materials. So that's kind of
say too much about this example either, but maybe just highlight the fact that this is really just made out of paper and tape um, and uh, uh, some traditional electronics. So no soldering, no gluing, no nothing, just taping, which we think is, is pretty cool and fun. Um, and you can also see, uh, so well, taping isn't exactly sketching, it's pretty close that the feel that you get and kind of the, the expressive and, and improvisational uh, possibilities of tape are, are similar in feel to that of actually drawing or sketching. Um, so I want to share one final uh, paper example. example is, is a set of techniques that we've been developing for kind of paper that can fold and animate itself. And those examples are made with copper tape and then a material called shaped memory alloy, which probably some of you are familiar with, but essentially it's a metal that changes shape when you heat it up. And we can heat it up by running electrical current through it. And then if we use it intelligently, we can make this set of mechanical paper structures that move and transform pretty dramatically. Um, so what I've just shared is kind of a collection of techniques and approaches that we've been developing for integrating paper and electronics and computation. Um, but arguably, what's more interesting than us making this set of examples is us kind of giving those tools and making them accessible to other people and then seeing what they do, seeing how other people respond to those materials, what they make with them and how that impacts kind of culture and creativity and so on. So I want to share with you now uh, some of that work. Um, so here are just a couple of snapshots taken from a number of different workshops that we've taught um, over the past kind of year or, or so. Um, with different groups of people working with uh, paper and electronics and computation. So this gives you a, a, a good sense of kind of the range of audiences that we've been connecting with and engaging with. Um, here's a, uh, uh, an assortment of some of the artifacts that uh, participants have been making. Um, and I mostly won't say too much about these, but I wanted to point out a couple of the things that, that were surprising and compelling to us in some of these objects. So on the upper left-hand corner there, what you see is a bowl um, that a woman brought to one of our workshops um, that was a paintable electronics <coughs> workshop. And so we were envisioning that people would be painting onto sheets of paper but this woman was a potter, and she brought this bowl that she had turned to the workshop. And she said, well, I can paint on my bowl, right? And this is something that had never occurred to us until she kind of brought this piece. But of course, when you work with paint, uh, you can paint onto three-dimensional surfaces like pottery. So all of a sudden, uh, the, you know, there, this new universe has opened up for electronics, so kind of three-dimensional surfaces with uh, painted 
sketched circuitry on them. Um, the image in the upper right hand corner here, this is a lovely origami piece uh, where all of the electronic components are really thoughtfully integrated into the form. So actually the head is a binder clip that's clipping the battery onto the taped paper construction and then you can see the lights are, are filling up his wings with color. We thought that was really lovely. Um, this example is a, a wonderful one that showcases how most of the people that participate in our workshops are driven kind of by expression and often by aesthetic expression. Um, and the, the purpose of their designs and kind of the intent of their designs are often decorative and kind of visual. And so this was a, a small but really elegant example of how electronics can be incorporated into kind of traditional aesthetic paper crafts in all sorts of interesting ways. Um, and then this final example um, is showing a, a student who started to use the copper tape in this kind of wild and sculptural way. So the, the circuitry elements here are not only carrying the electricity around, they're also forming the structure of this simple culture. And also, again, was kind of an example that caught us by surprise in this marvelous way, but kind of a whole different way of thinking about kind of integrating electronic function and form here that seems rich with possibilities and implications. Um, I also wanted to just show you one. Uh, Ooh, video. That's what I'm like. okay. Reset. Switch. <laughs> also, just a, a simple project that someone uh, kind of designed and completed in an afternoon workshop, uh, working on kind of paper-based computing that was so lovely and elegant and, and simple. Um, so, and um, this example, also very aesthetic, but also incorporating really interesting sensibility around interaction and what makes for a, a compelling and interesting interaction with a digital artifact. Um, so those are some of the constructions and designs that people outside of our lab are making with these tools. Um, we're also really interested in trying to understand some of these social and cultural experiences that people have when they come to our workshops, and also trying to understand who is interested in this kind of thing, and is it people who are maybe different from the person who would, say, sign up for a robotics workshop or a hacking sound toys workshop. So who are these people, and kind of why do they come to these experiences that we host, and then you know what do they get out of them? So I'm just going to give you a little kind of snapshots into these questions. Um, so first, uh, why do people come to do this stuff when we hold workshops at our lab and other places? Um, so what we found through kind of hosting a lot of sessions like this is that people uh, come to experiences that are connected to expertise that they already have or interests that they already have or kind of cultural resonances that they already have. Um, we're also really interested in trying to understand who's interested in, in these kinds of activities. And again, is it kind of different from the usual suspects? So we kind of keep track of who shows up to these kinds of activities. And just to, again, give you a quick snapshot of this for some of our recent um, uh, electronic uh, paper workshops, I hate to put up a table in a talk like this, but uh, the main thing that you can take away with this is that we're able to re reach really diverse groups of people. And much more diverse, um, the people that we're able to engage are, are generally much more diverse than the people who are engaged in traditional, like, let's learn about technology workshops. So these materials and tools really have the ability to engage broad and diverse groups of people. So that's something that we care a lot about and you know we can do using these materials. So these materials reach people who probably otherwise 
may not have any experiences working with electronics or computation um, or paper craft for that matter in some cases. Um, so what kinds of experiences do people have when they come uh, to these sessions? Um, uh, again, I'll just kind of give you a snapshot into one experience uh, that people have. This is kind of our, um, all our ideal uh, workshop participant might respond in this way. This is certainly not the experience that everyone has, but the fact that at least some people have this kind of experience with the tools and materials that we design and develop, I think is a testament to uh, their power and their potential. Um, so that these uh, initial experiences with the medium can lead to long-lasting and deep kind of engagement with the technology and the materials over time. Okay, so that was a, uh, a glimpse into some of the work that we've been doing with paper and electronics and computation and both some of the technological work that we've done and also some of the work that we've done in sharing that uh, with other people and engaging other people. I wanted to now shift gears a bit and talk a little bit about uh, a different set of materials and a different set of audiences, uh, namely to talk about sewing and some uh, a project that I've been working on for several years now. Um, so about, gosh, I hate to think now, five or so, five or six maybe years ago, um, I developed a construction kit uh, called Lily Pad Arduino. Um, and this is what uh, it looks like. Um, it is a construction kit that consists of a set of sewable electronic modules. So there's a sewable Arduino microcontroller. Um, that's the guy you see in the, in the center. That's a little programmable computer. And then a set of sewable uh, sensors like a light sensor and a temperature sensor and output devices like lights and motors and so on. Uh, and the way you connect these pieces is you stitch them together with electrically conducted thread and you can see a spool of that on the side. Um, so why would you want this kit? What can you do with it? Um, let me just show you a couple of examples of things that people have made with uh, the lily pad Arduino tool.
but that gives you a good sense of kind of the kinds of things that you can make with the lily pad construction kit. Um, I wanted to talk just very briefly now about some of what we've been doing with the lily pad uh, kit more recently. So we've been trying to kind of expand um, the reach of the lily pad and kind of get it into specifically educators' hands and kind of get it out into kind of middle school and high schools. Um, so these are some snapshots of recent workshops uh, that uh, some of my students have taught and also some workshops that we've taught in collaboration with educators um, uh, and gives you also a snapshot of some of the different kind of kinds of people and communities that have been working with the kit uh, in these workshops. Uh, here are some of their constructions. So these are some uh, themed activities that we've been designing. This is these are snapshots from one of them. So this is an interactive monsters um, activity that one of my students developed, which has been really fun. Students with their their monsters. Uh, this is a, another activity where uh, students make. Uh, construct these textile pianos and then they can uh, play individual pianos but they can also snap the pianos together and make a long giant piano that then has m many many octaves and they can play this long giant piano all together which has been fun. Um, so I wanted to return then to some of these questions for the Lily Pat Arduino and examine them. So examine some of the social issues that we've been able to explore around this kit and this set of materials. So first, um, this question of why do people participate? And to give you um, a snapshot into that, uh, again, the, we see these similar patterns of people are engaged in these activities and interested in them when they connect to kind of existing things that they already do. Um, um, so we're also really interested in examine this, examining this question of who participates. Um, and I want to go a little bit deeper into this uh, thread. Um, so, so because uh, we've been able to do some more interesting kind of uh, telling research for this particular kit. Um, so first of all, the good news is people do participate. <coughs> Um, in a particular, and I mean that in a particular way. So the Lily Pad Arduino is actually a commercial toolkit. So it's been commercially available since 2007. And that's given us this really unique and interesting uh, opportunity to see and understand who participates in uh, this space. So who uses the Lily Pad Arduino and what do they use it for, um, and so on. So, since 2007, um, over 100,000 uh, boards, lily pad boards, have been sold. So it's out there, and people are using it and doing stuff with it. Um, so we are interested in, in seeing kind of who are those people. Um, so a couple of years ago, to better understand that and get a sense of it, we did this research study where we found um, a whole whole bunch of projects that were done. Uh, and then documented online. And we did that for the Lily Pad Arduino kit, and you can see a collection of those projects in the snapshot in the right-hand side. Um, and we also did that for the more traditional Arduino board, which is a, a functionally equivalent piece of electronics, um, but just looks and feels different and was designed for kind of a different set of purposes. So um, what you see on the left is a collection of projects that people built with the more traditional uh, Arduino board. Um, and so what came out of this study um, were some interesting things. And you probably could guess what came out of it. But um, basically, the, the people who were using these two kits were pretty similar in lots of ways. So similar ages, so people generally in their 20s and their 30s. Um, similar geographic locations, so largely people from the U.S. and Europe with little kind of hot spots in Japan and uh, other parts of Asia, um, but they were really, really different along one dimension. So when we looked at gender, um, this is what we found. Um, so the people uh, who made and posted Arduino products <coughs> online uh, 
uh, 86% of those projects were done by guys. Um, conversely, for the lily pad uh, of people who made and then posted projects online, 65% of those were done by women. Um, so just this kind of wacko, dramatic uh, turning on its head uh, of traditional gender patterns in technology um, that came about um, just through the creation and release of this different tool set. Um, so we were pretty pleased and intrigued by this result. So who's participating in these spaces? Well, the answer is a really different community than you know was participating in the uh, more traditional spaces, which we uh, think is pretty cool um, and attests to kind of the power of rethinking the materials and tools that we use for technology. Um, okay, so that's cool that people are participating. And there's another interesting question to ask, which is what kind of experiences do they have? Well, um, again, at least some people have really positive experiences, and that's super awesome. Um, so here is, is a, a quote from one young woman that we talked to who kind of really movingly described how the lily pad was a tool that she felt comfortable with and that kind of introduced her to the universe of kind of technology and electronics and it was kind of an introduction she you know might not have had without this tool so some really cool experiences like that at least that this kit has facilitated um, so this all seems awesome um, but recently, we've been starting to do some research in this space that looks at some of the more negative experiences that people are having um, when they um, try to join more traditional technology communities. Um, so what happens when we dramatically kind of diversify the community, people who build technology, and also kind of the look and feel of the technology itself. Um, so we started to notice this trend um, where, first of all, uh, electronic textile constructions were getting more and more visibility. So they were receiving more and more attention on popular blogs, um, like, for example, the SparkFun electronics blog. So, popular technology and electronics blog. So here's one um, example, e-textile blog post, um, where you know, the post might showcase a collection of these textile electronic products. Um, and people had some interesting things to say about these posts. So, so we started to see this trend of people just responding really intensely and negatively to kind of this diversification of electronics. Um, and, and in such a way, kind of rejecting, kind of saying to the people who are doing this different thing with technology, saying, you know, you don't belong here. This is not what we do. Um, what you're doing is not technology. It's something else. It's craft. It's some lower, kind of lesser thing. And making really, kind of drawing really clear kind of social boundaries about what's accept acceptable in this community and what's not. Um, and how, and even to such ex an extent, in kind of many, in many of these more negative posts, this theme comes through of kind of people's own identity feeling threatened. Like if, if this is part of the community, then it's not a part of the community that I want to take, that it's not a community that I want to be part of, want to take place in. Um, so the answer to the question of what kinds of experiences do people have, um, 
the lesson that we're kind of learning from this longer term experience in this space is that it's complicated. And as we kind of, in many ways, achieve some of our goals in diversifying the kinds of technology that's created and the kinds of experiences that people can have, um, there are, there's some friction in that diversification. And uh, we're in the process now of trying to understand this better and trying to understand how we might be able to, you know, find ways to create more um, supportive and uh, uh, generous communities for newcomers, especially newcomers who are taking these unorthodox approaches that we're promoting. Um, so, yes, kind of we're in the midst of trying to understand and make sense of this stuff. Okay, so those were um, some snapshots of the work that we're doing with uh, paper and textiles. Um, before I conclude, I wanted to talk about one other area that we've been doing work in that I'm really excited about and our group is really excited about. Um, and it's uh, slight, it has a very different emphasis than the previous two kind of threads. Um, and that's our work in uh, into helping people create their own consumer electronic devices. So we've recently been exploring how we can enable people to build things like alarm clocks and radios um, and maybe even cell phones so that the pieces of electronics that we use um, really intensively and regularly in our day-to-day -day lives. So how can we help people build those devices that they would then kind of use and interact with? Um, so one of my students in particular, David Mellis, um, has been exploring that idea uh, specifically through uh, open source hardware. So using open source hardware as a way to help people build their own consumer electronics. Um, so what does that mean exactly? So this is an example of a simple piece of consumer electronics that probably all of you guys use. So a set of speakers um, that can plug into your laptop um, or your phone or um, kind of other device. Um, and uh, it turns out that it's pretty easy to build a set of speakers yourself. Um, all you need is kind of a physical enclosure uh, and an amplifier and some speakers. Um, so he designed uh, an electronic uh, board that you see there on the upper left-hand corner um, that has all of the electronics that are necessary for the speaker. Um, he also designed a physical enclosure that can be cut out on the laser cutter, and that you see in the lower part of the upper left-hand corner. Um, and then he also very carefully documented the process of putting together this set of speakers. And then he posted all of these things online. So he posted the design for the uh, electronic hardware. He posted the design for the physical exterior. Um, and he posted this really detailed set of assembly instructions. Um, and, um, and then we've been just seeing what different people do with that set of information. So because people have access to all of the files that specify the design of the set of speakers. They can then tinker with their, those files and make their own versions in all sorts of interesting kind of creative ways. So here are just a couple of variations that other people have made. So this is actually not exactly tinkering with the files. This is just tinkering with the materials that you use to put together um, the speakers. This is one uh, fun variation. Here uh, is a variety where you can see uh, the person edited the laser cutter files. You can kind of change them to make this uh, cute set of owl speaker. Um, and this is probably my favorite. Um, here, uh, this person tinkered uh, with the materials in a really creative and imaginative way. So this is a, a RISD student. Uh, named Sarah, uh, Sarah Pease, uh, <coughs> who found these uh, ball jars that the speakers rested perfectly in, um, and she made this set. 
So we think this opens up just a, a, a new and different and compelling avenue where people can use their own really personal and unique approaches and, and working styles and, and materials to creatively construct and interact with technology. So this is a relatively young area that we're just starting to explore but are excited about. Um, so stepping back, just to return to some of the themes that I introduced in the introduction, um, Here's kind of what we're trying to do. And I just wanted to, to highlight what I think is important and exciting to me about the work that I've shown. So I think we're um, finding and developing new ways of thinking about technology, um, ways that combine the concrete and the abstract, the improvisational and the planned. Um, this is uh, my favorite example for often talking about these things. So this is a drawing of a circuit, um, of course, but it's also a functioning circuit and, and is a just lovely way to show how these new kinds of artifacts can combine abstract representation with a con the concrete functioning object, can combine this uh, functionality with a visual expressive thing and so these new materials, these new approaches, I think can really, are, can powerfully change the way we think about and approach uh, construction in these domains. Um, these new tools and materials and approaches, and in many cases, the new people that we draw in, then go on to create new kinds of technologies. Uh, these new approaches and, and new tools and new people, they bring new stuff to the table. Um, so you start to see things like 3D uh, circuits, so circuits that are painted on or drawn on 3D objects. So who would have thought to do that without these new materials, without someone who was a potter kind of engaging in this kind of activity? Um, and then finally, this approach and, uh, that we're taking, I think, is really powerful uh, ability to draw in new communities, to, to diversify the cultures that are engaging with technology. Um, and so here's just uh, a lovely snapshot that I think illustrates that. This is from a, a workshop that we taught at a local uh, craft museum in Boston, um, where we just had voluntary participants sign up. But um, this was the group that showed up, so a group of really accomplished artists and designers, but all who had never encountered uh, electronics or programming before, um, but who were comfortable uh, to do that in this particular setting where they could rely on and kind of leverage their existing expertise and skills. So thank you very much for your time.